endurance and equanimity are two virtues that are very similar, but they're not quite the same. With equanimity, the mind is not affected by things it likes or doesn't like. It has an ability to stay on an even keel. With endurance, you're dealing with things you don't like. And whether the mind is on an even keel or not, you're able to hold yourself back. It's very closely related to restraint. In fact, one way of defining endurance was the ability to maintain restraint for long periods of time. And often you have to exercise endurance in the absence of equanimity. In other words, you're strongly tempted to respond to things you don't like, but you're held back, basically by right view. Realizing that if you respond in kind to what the other person has said, then it becomes your karma. It's as if they threw a hot burning coal at you and you bend down to pick it up to throw it back. Who gets burned? You get burned. So endurance requires a lot of talking to yourself. You don't just squash your emotions. Pretend they're not there. You have to admit that they're there, but that it's not wise to act on them. This is why it's, it's good to reflect on karma. Notice that if you don't like somebody, it's not the same as having ill will for them. The antidote for ill will is goodwill. The antidote for anger is to remind yourself that if you acted on the anger, you would do something really stupid. You would please the other person, and at the same time, you would be burdening yourself down with unskillful karma. That first thought, you don't want to please the other person, that's spiteful. You're using spite in order to overcome the anger at the very least, to get some control over it. Psychology has given a bad name for people who control their emotions. They think that in every case you control your emotion, it goes underground, and it turns into a mental illness of one kind or another, and you can have a physical component as well. But that's a sign that modern psychology doesn't understand restraint. If restraint is wise, it knows how to diffuse the energy. This is one of the reasons why it's good to be able to work with the breath. Something negative comes up, and if you're sensitive to the breath energies in the body, you'll know where that negative energy gets lodged. And you can breathe through it, empty it out, make sure you don't carry it around. I had a student in Singapore one time complained about how every day he had to come home from work and meditate for a while. He felt he'd like it. it was a garbage can during the day. People were just throwing things into the garbage can. And he had to empty it out before he could have a decent evening. And as I told him, you've got to cut a hole in the bottom of the garbage can. So when things come in, they go out. You can see them coming. You know what they are. They're garbage. Why carry them around? You might say that what's an affront to your sense of pride, your sense of your sense of self. But you know what the Buddha has to say about a sense of self. All too often it can be very unskillful. And if you're making yourself miserable for the sake of that sense of self, is it worth it? The sense of self that has to be treated nicely by everybody all the time. That's a two year old self. You want to be an adult. Reflect on the fact that speech in the world is of many kinds. There's kind speech and unkind speech, true speech, false speech. 
speech worth listening to, a speech not worth listening to. This is the way it is in the world. So when you find yourself being subjected to speech that is untrue or unkind, or not really worth listening to, don't take it as a personal affront. It's simply part of the human race. The fact that someone else has chosen to speak in those terms doesn't really reflect on you. Not necessarily, at least. You can look at the words, and if it's criticism that really is useful, then regardless of what the, the intention of the person who gave it, if you find that, yes, they are pointing out something that is a fault in your case, remember that the Buddha said that regard those who point out your faults as someone who's pointing out treasure. Because if you're a really serious practitioner, you want to know, where are my faults? Where can I work to change my behavior? And if someone points it out, regardless of whether they do it in an ill-meaning or well-meaning way, you've got your handle. You've got your point of focus. So try to use some discernment in your restraint. You realize that you don't want your goodness to depend on the goodness of other people, because that's an extremely undependable support. You want to depend on your determination. Remember, we're here to develop the perfections. And the perfections have to be developed by determination. They don't naturally come. They come because you've seen the harm you can do to yourself and to others when you're unskillful, and you really don't want to cause that harm anymore. So you hold back, you restrain yourself, and you're going to learn a lot about the mind as you do, because all these different voices are going to come in and say, well, what, how about saying this, or how about saying that, or if I don't say anything at all, they're not going to respect me. Where are those voices coming from? The conceit that lies behind them. Is it wise conceit? The Buddha does recognize that there is such a thing, but all too often it has nothing to do with wisdom at all. Just a simple desire to get back. And that's certainly not a Dharma desire. So you develop restraint, and then you learn how to maintain that restraint. That's the patience. That's the endurance. No matter how outrageous the other person gets, you're not going to do or say anything unskillful. This doesn't mean you don't say anything at all. If you can think of something that can diffuse the situation, go ahead and say it. But just because someone else has drawn a battle line doesn't mean that you have to take up the battle. I was talking one time with a man who had been a student of a Chun Li, and he'd finally ordained at a time when a John Fuang was in charge of the monastery in Chandaburi. And one of his duties was to act as John Fuang's attendant. And there was a young monk that a John Fuang dressed down one day in front of all the other monks. And this monk, who was the attendant, overheard the monk who had been dressed down, saying to a few other monks that he was going to go up and show a John Fung a thing or two. And so our monk stayed under the hut, just in case something happened. He saw the monk coming, going up the stairs. Unfortunately, he couldn't hear what was being said. The monk went up, bowed down. So when the monk goes down, it doesn't necessarily mean he's already respecting you. Sometimes monks can bow down in preparation for who knows what. But he bowed down, and a John Fung said something, and the monk burst out and cried. I'd really like to know what a John Fung said, because the words that can defuse the situation are like gold.
And you can master those words only if you learn how to show restraint. Because it gives you the time to think about what would be a, an appropriate response. And as you show respect, restraint, you can also get to observe the other person, which you wouldn't if you were just thinking about what you would like to say out of your anger, out of your displeasure. So always remember that the person who shows restraint has the upper hand. You're not showing yourself to the other person. And if you can't think of the word that will diffuse the situation, well and good. If you can't, at the very least you haven't done anything unskillful. And at the same time you can start working on your equanimity. This is one of those cases where outside behavior then can move into the mind. There are other cases where the movement goes in the other direction. But this is one where you learn restraint first, you learn endurance first, you learn how to put up with things, and then you learn how to put up with things in the most efficient way, which is not letting your emotions get all over the place. You're able to develop the wisdom that sees that there are a lot of issues in the world that are simply not worth picking up, not getting worked up about. And when you've seen that, you've mastered a really good skill. And you've developed a whole pile of perfections. As I said, this requires discernment, it requires determination. You've got the perfection of endurance and patience, and you've got the perfection of equanimity. There's four perfections right there. And if you can manage that many in a single day, you're doing well. <laughs>